Okay. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome those of you who are in the room with us today and those of you who are listening through our webinar. Um, welcome to the Sci-Fi Seminar Series, Rabies is Real, an Innovative Approach to Rabies Awareness. Just to let our participants on the webinar know that we will remain in lecture mode for the duration of the call. Uh, if you have any questions, please send them through the chat pod that you will see at the bottom right of your screen. I'd like to introduce uh, Jane Morrell. Jane completed a Bachelor of Science before attending Ryerson University, where she completed a Bachelor of Applied Science in Environmental Health. She gained experience while working in private industry before coming to Hamilton Public Health Services as a certified public health inspector. After four years in Hamilton, Jane has become the lead inspector for the raccoon rabies outbreak with a focus on risk assessment and health promotion. Welcome, Jane. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you to Public Health Ontario and Sci-Fi for uh, inviting me to speak today. So uh, we are going to talk about uh, rabies, rabies is real, and our innovative approach to it in Hamilton. So just to give you some background on uh, the start of the outbreak for us, so back in December 2015 is when we found out that we now had raccoon rabies, uh, a strain of raccoon rabies in Hamilton. That was the first report of raccoon rabies ever in southern Ontario. Um, and actually that cage picture there is the cage that the raccoon was in that the dog uh, chewed through to get to the raccoon. And of course this came through on a Friday afternoon like everything else in public health. How did we get uh, the raccoon strain in Hamilton? Well, it was a translocating animal. We're not sure what type of transportation, uh, probably a transport truck, that came all the way near Vermont over 500 kilometers away into the Hamilton area. Not that particular raccoon on the garbage truck, though. <laughs> So what does our surveillance process look like? <clears throat> so a Hamilton resident would call in any sick, strange behaving, or dead wildlife uh, that they see out in the community. Uh, our Hamilton Animal Services are amazing. They respond to all these calls. Uh, the animal's tagged, stored in a freezer, and gets weekly picked up by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. At the peak of our outbreak, we were sending 50 samples a week for testing. Uh, now we're about 20. Um, and then, so MNR, MNRF would take that sample back to Peterborough and they would do a preliminary uh, rabies test on it called a DRIT. If that sample came back positive, uh, then they would send it off to CFIA for the true FAT testing. Um, then we would be notified that that animal came back positive. We would do a double follow-up with the resident because they were already asked at the time of pickup if they'd had any exposure or if their pet had been exposed. But now that we have the results, we like to just be sure they, that there was no exposure to that animal. The whole process right now takes about three weeks, but at the onset of our um, outbreak, because of the volume of animals that were being sent, it was taking well over a month before we got results. Um, this raccoon in particular, we're waiting on his results. Uh, he just died at the fence like that. Um, so he could come back positive. Um, and the next picture I'm going to show you, if you're a little squeamish, you might want to look away. Uh, but this is actually how they take the brain sample, which the first time I saw it, I thought it was rather unique because I figured they went in through the top of the head, but they don't. So that's how they take the uh, sample. So our current picture, this was as of February 6th. Uh, it's actually 282 now. We did have a positive last week. And we also had a skunk that was confirmed with bat strain rabies. That's not included in that total. But that's the breakdown per species. The big picture though, um, again, these numbers are from February 6th. So the raccoon strain is 390 and the fox strain is now 15. Um, the green dots are all the samples that have gone in for testing. Uh, the bluish purple are all the positives. Uh, the red diamonds up to the top of the map there, those are the fox strain. Hamilton has sent well over 2,000 samples and approximately 16% of those are coming back positive. So when this outbreak started um, and we were getting, uh, positives were coming in fast and furious, we realized that the workload was increasing for us. Um, it, we needed so much resources, uh, new campaign, we needed 
staffing. So we put in an application to the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care for one-time funding, which was supported by our Board of Health, uh, just in case we didn't receive the funding. And we were successful in receiving that, uh, so that allowed us to uh, have two temporary full-time people, as well as some money towards promotion, educational materials, uh, holding low-cost rabies clinics, um, and then our new campaign. So what did we need to change? So we needed a new approach to low-cost uh, vaccines in the city of Hamilton for pets. Uh, we needed new investigation and assessment tools. We also wanted a new campaign to bring rabies back up into the forefront because it was not on everybody's mind when the outbreak started. Um, and we wanted some innovative resources to support that campaign. So for the low cost options, uh, at the time of the outbreak, Hamilton had no uh, options for anybody that was low income and could not afford to vaccinate their pet. We had tried in the past. It was not uh, as successful as we had hoped. Uh, but this time we focused it more differently. It was a one-on-one -on -one approach where I met with uh, individual vets to discuss the risk in Hamilton and provide them with some resources. So it built a really good relationship with our vet clinics. Um, they were looking for info that they weren't getting. Um, and then they also decided to participate in the various options that we were offering for low cost vaccines. And it also helped uh, increase bite reports that were coming through now because they were previously reporting them as much. So it was a really good uh, partnership that was formed because of that one-on-one -on -one approach. So the three options that we now have for our residents are um, our external rabies clinics, which the first one was held in 2016, and we vaccinated over 363 pets in the pouring rain. Uh, that is the actual lineup before the rain started. Um, and then we've also held one, another one in 2016 and one in uh, and two in 2017, and we're starting our 2018 series now. Um, we also offer vets to do a low-cost vaccine program within their own clinics, and we support that by advertising that, providing that information out. Um, and then now we have a voucher program in place. So we have 14 uh, clinics that are part of the voucher, and that's only through public health. When we do an investigation, the pet is not up to date, and the resident cannot afford to vaccinate. Uh, so they get a voucher from public health. They choose one of the participating vets. They make the appointment. and So it's working really well. We also needed some new tools, so we created a new surveillance form. Uh, usually when you're dealing with a rabies investigation, there's a human component to it. This was just an animal with no human, no domestic attached to it, so we needed a specialized form um, because there was an officer that was collecting this animal and there was a resident that was calling it in. So we created a whole new form for uh, collecting that data. We also had to change our risk assessment form. Where is the animal from, locally acquired? in or near Hamilton, because now we were high risk. So we had to add that to our, our risk assessment form. These are some things we've kind of learned along the way. Um, some of the positive wildlife did appear healthy. And when I say that, it wasn't you know running around healthy. This is like roadkill, that the fur looked good, no crusty eyes, weight was good, and then came back positive. So. Um, lack of wounds noted on many of the positive animals, and that's something we always ask when we're doing our risk assessment, is there any visible wounds to an animal? So this kind of brought to our attention that the, the lack of wounds doesn't reduce the risk at all. Uh, the most common symptoms that we were finding, uh, not eating and drinking, uh, difficulty walking and vocalization. And a large portion of our uh, rabid wildlife were also positive for distemper. And when I say large portion, over 95%. So the evidence of distemper in an animal does not reduce the possibility of it also having rabies. This was really important, this for our nuisance wildlife and our rehab clinics that were very well versed in noting if an animal had distemper and then they would have that false sense of security that the symptoms being displayed by the animal were truly just distemper. No, it, it definitely could be also rabies at the same time. Um, explaining risks from non-bites and scratch exposure. So, you know, we encountered a lot of cases with this outbreak. Uh, some were trappers that were handling animals and were in contact with nerves. Um, others were direct contact with saliva, not realizing that we all have micro cuts on our hands, and if your hand is actually directly in that saliva, that is an exposure. Um, 
something we learned after our first uh, positive stray cat, because you always learn along the way, was take photos of uh, stray cats before you send for testing. Uh, the photo after you <laughs> cut the head is not so good for showing the public. Uh, but so we started taking photos that way if it did come back positive because this was a stray out in the community We needed something to be able to show people if they thought they were exposed to that animal um, And then also carefully wording uh, your media releases because uh, again with the stray cats uh, when we did um, Mass uh, media release in the area of the first stray cat people were thinking the cat was still roaming in the area and were concerned that every gray cat they saw that could be the rabid cat. So making it clear that animal is no longer in the community, but was from this time period. Um, and then that an animal, how quickly the symptoms can uh, to show up. So an example here, this was our second um, rabid cat. So it was first seen in the Glanbrook area. It was given food and water by uh, the resident. This was a stray that had just wandered onto her property. No fresh wounds, appeared rather friendly and then it took off and she didn't see it the rest of the day. Monday, cat comes back, same area, so she fed it again and it ate again, good signs. Uh, she was able to coax it into a trap and she took it into animal services. So the cat was triaged there and it had no signs of illness and it was still eating and drinking. Tuesday, the cat's health did start to change a little. It had increased breathing, some drool uh, and spots of urine in the cage. Uh, still at this point, friendly, uh, but it was getting a little more agitated as the day went on. Breathing was increasing, not sitting down. So they were thinking urinary tract blockage or an upper respiratory infection. Um, again, cat though, still friendly, shining, showing no signs of aggression. It was taken to a, a local vet, and by the next day, uh, the cat was not breathing at all, a lot of drool, weakness to hind end, and in the afternoon, the aggression had um, set in. They went to euthanize the cat to send for testing, and it died at the time of euthanizing. So with less than 24 hours, a cat that just seemed to have an upper respiratory and a urinary tract infection was in full-blown rabies at that point, and a lot of people handling um, this seemingly friendly stray cat. So something that, you know, this was a good learning opportunity for us that the, the cat that you touched one day could still be transmitting the virus even though it doesn't have that full-blown what you're expecting symptoms. So then uh, we'll get to our campaign. Um, we wanted a new campaign to, to get that awareness out in the community. So we wanted it to grab the attention so that they'd ask questions. We wanted to drive people to our website and we wanted to prevent exposures before they happened. So that we hired a company, and this was the uh, original two pieces that they provided us. So we have the Bakun, and we had the very typical government public health looking babies piece here. Some of the team that I work on all loved the Bakun right off the bat. Mostly everybody else in our health unit liked the the raccoon one on its own. That seemed safe, that seemed what public health units would hand out, that was the route they wanted to go. We decided that we didn't like that answer, <laughs> so we were gonna do some focus group testing in the community uh, with some high risk groups and get other opinions before we you know, gave up on our raccoon creature here. So we did, we went out in the community and it was overwhelmingly well received that the raccoon was the image that uh, the community was drawn to. Even um, non-English speaking residents don't know what a raccoon is. They don't have them in their countries. They thought it was a dog. They would never have asked what that poster said. But this poster with the raccoon, they definitely asked questions because they know what a bat looks like and that's not a bat head. So it confused them and they therefore asked for translation. So our message was getting across even without translating our piece. So we were really happy with that. So our finished pieces are these, the baccoon and the scocks. I'm a little partial to the scocks myself, but, um, and we're quite happy with this campaign now. So we've put it at bus shelters, we even had it at Lime Ridge Mall uh, over Christmas, and Santa was actually right behind that. So while they stood in line for Santa, they got their rabies messaging. We've also done arena boards in every single arena in Hamilton. We did billboards. We even wrapped one of our animal services vehicles, so this vehicle will be on the road for quite a while and uh, our message will be out in the community. 
We've also shared our cam campaign with a lot of other uh, agencies and health units. So all Ontario health units received all the resources um, that we've created as well as our campaign. Uh, the Ontario Association for Veterinary Technicians, uh, Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, Province of New Brunswick, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, the Quebec Scientific Rabies Committee, <clears throat> the CDC, World Health Organization, and the USDA. So far, two health, Ontario health units have adopted our uh, campaign, um, and also the OAVT used our images for their uh, Is Your Pet Protected campaign that still runs until September 2018. And we were also lucky enough to present at uh, Rabies in the Americas that was in Calgary in October. We are also currently evaluating this campaign. So for the whole month of February, we are doing uh, online surveys on, uh, in regards to the campaign as well as in the community hard copy surveys. So we want to find out, are they aware of our campaign? Do they know that there's Rabies in Hamilton and also some basic Rabies knowledge as well? So we'll be doing that for the whole month. We also uh, wanted to make sure our campaign was successful in all areas, so promotion activities to support this campaign was outreach, presentations, electronic website and hard copy resources, media releases and updates to our Board of Health and videos. So some of the outreach that we did do, um, we had the general public obviously with children being a, a huge portion of that. Um, we did our campaign advertising as well as we did have a school resource that we put out. Uh, pet owners were also a high, higher risk, uh, so we also have in Hamilton a community cat um, population where caregivers care for these strays. It's estimated there's over 100,000 of these cats roaming free, so we also wanted to target them uh, specifically. Then we also have our high risk occupations for our animal services uh, that are doing this surveillance process with the ministry, our wildlife rehabilitation groups and nuisance wildlife companies and local trappers, pet storage groomers and kennels, and also our local farmers. Um, medical practitioners also needed some specific outreach. Uh, we needed to improve our pet fact sheet um, and we also created a video to support that as well. And then the transportation industry, uh, truck drivers specifically due to the risk of translocation. That's how that animal came into us. We needed to make sure we were helping to get that message out. So this is just some of the, the areas that we really focused on. Uh, we also update our website uh, as every week if we get a positive. Some weeks we don't have positives, but usually it's a weekly thing. So we make sure that all residents can go to our website and see what that current picture looks like in Hamilton. This is the uh, school resource we created, which is a rabies activity and coloring book. Uh, the door hanger is what we provide to all our animal services officers. So when they go to pick up uh, one of the animals for surveillance, sometimes the resident isn't home because this animal is dead on the property and so they tell them just come and get it. But we want to make sure we're still getting that message to them about rabies, what an exposure is and who to call. Uh, we also have magnets that was created and these are handed out at all our municipal service centers, our animal services officers have them. We hand them out in the public. So, And it gives you the three main numbers to call, which would be our health unit if it's been a human exposure, uh, animal services to pick up any wildlife that's uh, behaving strangely sick or dead, and then also uh, the MNRF, their baiting and surveillance program if you had questions on the baits. This was the translocation resource that we created. Uh, English and French. Uh, this resource uh, first was shown at a large truck uh, conference, but is now currently at two border crossings. So the one in Fort Erie Peace Bridge, as well as um, Queenston Lewiston in Niagara Falls, and at two major uh, truck stations in those areas, as well as a way station in Vineland. So just to help get that messaging out. Uh, to anybody in the transportation trucking industry. We also shared a similar resources without the driving raccoon though uh, for the Coast Guard for ships as well as rail. So we also um, wanted to, like I said, create some new resources that were different than we've had in the past. So we did do some videos. Uh, the first one we created was just a short PSA that was less than a minute. We aired that at Cineplex pre-show. We also have it on our website. It's been tweeted out on different social media, Facebook and Instagram. Um, it's, you know, certainly not your upbeat kind of uh, PSA, but it was definitely something that we felt was needed, um, 
that's just two of the screenshots from the video. Both this video um, and our animated video that we created, um, this one is five minutes long approximately. Um, if, as you can see down in the corner there, it has a picture of a sick raccoon. We really felt it was important to make sure our videos were getting across the messaging of the risk. Um, and we did have a lot of pushback when we were trying to create these. These are not welcome to Hamilton. It's a great place to live videos. These are, you know, this is a fatal virus and you need to be well aware of that. So it took a lot of work to get these videos approved and ready to go, uh, but we really felt strongly when the risk is high, the message needs to be just as high and not keeping it fun and light. Although the animated video does bring some humor to it, it definitely does show the public animals like that raccoon don't need your help. You need to call someone. You don't need to intervene because it could have rabies. The other video that we're extremely proud of, because uh, it's not something that is out there, um, was our PEP video. So with the help of my colleague Connie DeBenedit and Dr. Uh, Jessica Hopkins, they were able to put together this uh, tutorial video for the medical practitioners only on how to administer PEP from the start of how to uh, reconstitute the vaccine and then administer both the rig and the, the vaccine. Um, all of the vaccine we deliver in Hamilton has the link on it on the bag. So anybody, any physician that receives that vaccine has that link if, if they need to watch it. We just really found that once our outbreak was going strong and we were delivering a lot more PEP than we usually did, there was a lot of questions coming from doctors as well as some errors that were occurring. So we knew we needed to approach that um, and the video was a, a great resource for that. And that is the end of my presentation. Any questions? Right, awesome. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, we'll be taking any questions from inside the room here or anything that we have online on our webinar chat. Okay. Uh, Donna Taylor asks, how did you figure out it was from Vermont? So that specimen was sent to CFIA and then they also did serological testing on it. It took quite a while before those results were made public, but they can actually determine the strain of where that area it comes from because each strain is a little different in different areas. So it was close to the Vermont area, Eastern New York. Okay, our next question. The MNR maps that are publicly available show cumulative totals of the number of positive animals. Is there an epi curve for human cases so we can see the uh, epidemic is going on? Well, we have zero human cases, so uh, no map for that. Um, it definitely has slowed down from the beginning. Uh, we're not sure if it's just the public are not calling in as much, um, but also the time of year does, does play a role. And we have sent a lot of samples, so um, we have put a little dent in our, unfortunately, in our wildlife population for that. Um, but we are still getting positives on a regular basis, so. Okay. Hi, from inside the room. Hi, thanks for the, the great presentation and useful presentation. Um, the number of animals, rabbit, the number of raccoons, some skunk, I think a total of two cats, a llama, I recall. In another jurisdiction, we, but we had one fox as okay. well. Yeah. All right. I sort of asked this before, I think the previous um, Hamilton uh, presentation, but any idea why, you know, raccoon epizootic, and you only get two cats, one llama, I don't know how many other domestic animals, we'll consider the skunk, you know, wild animals, but yeah. why so few domestic animals that, that it went to, would you, why so that it's considered bad? I mean, any time, with the outbreak since it started, we've had domestic animals that have come in contact with these rabbit animals. That is something that we monitor and we report to a MAFRA. Those animals all received their booster 
even if they are vaccinated um, or they're put under um, a preliminary cautionary period uh, to be monitored. So the ones we're made note, known of through the surveillance program, it, it, they are vaccinated. So I, that could be part of the problem or not problem. That could be why we're not getting positives from those interactions. Um, for the two stray cats, they were both cats that were out in rural areas. Um, and we do notice that as the more rural we go, the less samples get called in. So those animals probably are dying off in areas that they might not be found. So there could have been more stray cats, uh, just not located and, and reported in. Okay, so back to the uh, webinar here. Uh, why storage of dead raccoon in freezer rather than in fridge? Well, probably a, a good question for MNRF, uh, but uh, because they were holding them for a long period of time, it, the, the frozen state would definitely um, keep that specimen as fresh as possible. We're also sending uh, samples in the hot days of summer too. So with it being frozen, it just makes sure that that sample stays fresh that whole travel. Okay. Okay, so there's a correction to that epi curve for animal cases in Hamilton again. Uh, uh, okay, could we have access to the presentation evaluation slides? Yes. Okay, is there any way to access the videos? Yeah, so in my presentation, I included all of the uh, YouTube um, links to them, the animated and the short one. The pet video though is a protected video because it is giving medical uh, advice. So it is um, not searchable and only provided to med medical practitioners. Uh, if you are a health unit, we definitely can share that link with you if you want to use it for your health unit for your medical practitioners. Okay. Another question here is if they could have access to the presentation slides. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Does freezing prevent accurate results? Uh, again, I think that would be a question for CFIA or MNRS. Any suggestions or recommendations to municipalities that may not have done any preparation for a rabies outbreak? Uh, absolutely. I think uh, the first step would be to get your um, community, your, uh, what was that document called again? No. The contingency plan. Get your contingency plan out and get it updated. When we pulled ours out, it was from 2006. Um, Connie likes to joke it had a layer of dust on it. So get that up to date just so that's ready to go because it really does outline all of the activities you need to start doing and the outreach you need to do. And as well, call Hamilton. We'll definitely help you. Uh, I know I've provided a lot of resources to all the health units, so uh, for sure we will help you get started. But I think that would be your first step is, is getting that contingency plan up to date. Is there a seasonal weather pattern to rabies, i.e. higher incidence in summer versus winter? Um, we definitely know more cases uh, or samples are being collected during the warmer months and even um, after um, the babies are born and the, the parents are taking them out and starting to do that separation period, so we find a lot more young at that time. Uh, but we've had positives all through the winter too, so an animal that is rabid is not behaving as it normally would and staying where it should. It's, it's definitely out in the community still, so, but the numbers are less in the winter. Okay, um, is there a bait vaccine program in place for the rural areas? Uh, all of Hamilton is baited by the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, whether that's uh, via plane or helicopter or hand baiting where it's more heavily populated. So yes, the whole city is being baited yearly. All right, another question here. Um, doesn't the head get placed into a cooler with ice during shipment? The whole body goes uh, for these surveillance animals. Okay. All right, uh, can you comment on the number of human exposures and pattern? 
our, we've had probably 10 to 15 percent more bite reports that have come in uh, over the course of this um, outbreak. Um, so definitely an increase in workload, but yeah, we have about 15 to 1600 cases a year right now with the outbreak. So. Okay, Jane, I think you answered this question. Are you able to share with other health units uh, um, adopted the Hamilton campaign? You said yes, yes. to that? Yes. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that an evaluation of this program has been conducted, is being conducted. Do you have some results from this evaluation as to how the program has improved the rabies vaccination among dogs and cats? Uh, we don't have that data yet, um, but anecdotally, I can tell you that I did a recent rabies uh, case where when I went out uh, to the home, the, the animal had been vaccinated at our last clinic. So it definitely, I, I saw firsthand how having those clinics available to the community um, allowed, you know, we had a, a bite incident that was attached to an already vaccinated animal thanks to that clinic. So. Okay, have you seen a large increase in the number of animal exposures reported to the health unit since the start of your media campaign? Yeah, so like I said, 10 to 15% more um, exposures of like bite incidents or scratch exposures have come through to us. So it's um, definitely, we've also gotten a lot of calls about uh, more so than prior to the outbreak on what an exposure is. Um, you know, what should they be looking for, for symptoms in animals. So the, the public is definitely more aware and, and uh, on alert for it now, so. Okay, have any of the municipalities adjacent to Hamilton started a similar monitoring program? Um, monitoring as in surveillance program, I'm assuming, um, and that would be yes, because Hamilton's not the only uh, municipality with positives, uh, Halton, Brant, uh, Haldeman, Norfolk, and Niagara all have uh, positives, as well as Huron and Perth County with the Fox strain. So surveillance is going on in all of those areas. Okay, a copy of this presentation will be available on SciFi's YouTube, and uh, I guess they can get in touch with you personally, Jane, as well, for a copy of the presentation. Yep. Okay. Um, let's see, is there mandatory rabies vaccination requirements for public health officers, inspectors in your region? Uh, for us as public health inspectors to have pre-exposure, no. Okay, of all the positive raccoon cases, how many presented as distemper as well? So that was well over 95% of our positives had distemper as well. All right, we have a few more people typing. The presentation will be available on the Sci-Fi YouTube channel. Okay, any, okay, question in the room? Um, early in your presentation, I, I think you were talking about raccoons and exposures, and you mentioned that um, the raccoons were not eating or drinking. How would the person know that, like they must have had more prolonged. Uh, sorry, I'm talking about like with the stray cats that stopped eating and drinking, uh, even the, the cows in person here on the llama, any animal that we were able to not, we weren't knowing what the raccoon was doing out in the wild. Yeah. Okay, has there been a need to increase enforcement for vaccination of dogs and cats? Any charges to date? Um, no charges to date, uh, but that's because now we have those three options available. So when somebody uh, can't afford that vaccine, it's $25 now, um, thanks to the voucher program as well as uh, our clinics, internal and external. So every, we're getting way better compliance, so no need to charge. Okay, is vaccination of dogs and cats linked to licensing? No, not currently in Hamilton. Okay, we have a few more people typing. Do you have an estimated an estimate of the total cost of this campaign? So I can give you the cost of the creative aspect of the campaign to create 
the whole stocks and Bakun, uh, and that was the poster, business cards, uh, brochure, uh, banners. It was just under $3,000, the best money ever spent. Uh, now, of course, we had printing uh, costs and then advertising and promotion costs that, to support that campaign out in the community, uh, but the creative work behind that was just under $3,000. Well, yes, 163000 was spent in total, but not on the creative uh, creation of that campaign. Okay. Um, how is the subsidized voucher program funded? So the voucher program is uh, strictly an agreement between the vets that have agreed and public health. So it's not advertised out in the community, but uh, the vet is willing to accept the $25 fee, tax included, no exam uh, with that fee. And the resident pays the money to the vet. So there's no, no subsidy at all. Question in the room? So along that line, I think you alluded to the fact that prior to the outbreak, you had no clinics and so forth, and then you had to kind of, I'll say, start from scratch and get mm -hmm. them going. And I think, unless I be interpreting, there was reluctance on the veterinarian behalf. Yes. Can you explain what it was and why they didn't necessarily want to do this? So I, back in 2012, um, the vets in our community were approached to, to offer a low-cost um, option to residents, and a lot of vets were uh, on board for it, except for some, and the vocalizing of those, some then put the rest of the vets off. And then the um, CBO did change regulations to allow for um, external clinics without vaccine or without examinations so they made it easier for vets to partake in a, a low-cost option because they didn't have to give the full exam um, so once those CBO rules changed and that's why I approached it differently as a one-on-one -on -one so that there was no other um, competition so to speak in the room it was me and that vet talking alone and they could make a decision based on what was best for their clinic so whether they wanted to partake in all three things or just one but it definitely went over way better that way. Yeah. So, okay, and I, I assume the biggest factor was just money. But I, I don't know what a vet gets for a raising vaccine, but 25 bucks is a lot less than... Yeah, I think the average is close to $100, but that gives you a full exam as well with that. Um, I think some of the reluctance, uh, you know, in all fairness to vets, was doing a vaccine without a full exam and any... Rep, you know, anything that would happen after they vaccinated that pet and it went home, who's liable and issues around that. So uh, the CBO has been great about um, making it quite clear on, you know, making this easy for vets to be able to participate in this. So for our external clinics that public health runs, our vets that uh, participate in that just show up with their stethoscope that day. We provide everything else to them. Yeah. It's just historically, though, these clinics have gone on for decades. Mm -hmm. Those same issues would have been yeah. probably a lot more animal vaccines. But then, I think it's that, just the, the community uh, that we had at that time, and and it is it has improved greatly now. So I'm very thankful to our vet community that is participating on these because we couldn't hold these clinics if it wasn't for them. So okay. Um. Let's see here. Hampton Experience, um, how was it determined who would be the lead agency uh, and or bear the financial costs? Well, I don't know that there is a lead agency. I'm not sure what the question is it's being specific, like whether which municipality that's going through the outbreak is the lead. I mean, we have a lot more cases in Hamilton. But as for like how we were handling the, the outbreak, with all our other uh, partners, so MNRF, OMAFRA, our vet community, everybody that was involved in all of this, Ministry of, Nat of Health, uh, Long-Term Care and Health, it just became very clear, thanks to our contingency plan, on whose role was what and what we needed to do. So we all worked together well. Um, it actually went so, so smoothly at the beginning, considering we were in the midst of an outbreak that we've never experienced before. So the outbreak, we found out about like our first case on the Friday, on the Monday, MNRF was already in town starting to drop baits because it was an extremely mild winter. And we just 
worked together perfectly from that moment on. Okay. I saw that I missed a question there. Um, what did you mean by low-cost vaccine in earlier parts of the presentation? So the vaccine cost is $25, whether it's in an external clinic that we run, an internal clinic in a vet's office, or through the voucher program. Which, uh, which criteria do you use to select the persons who are in need of a subsidized voucher? So these would have to be uh, dogs or cats over three months of age that are not currently vaccinated um, and are involved in a bite or scratch incident that we are investigating in our health unit. As well, the owner of the pet stresses to the inspector assign that case a financial burden for getting their pet vaccinated and the inspector also is present at that home with that resident and can verify that this is something that this resident does need. We're not asking for people to give financial records over. It's evident that the person does need it and so we give them the voucher. This is, we're over two years of using the voucher and we've used less than 10 a year. So it's definitely not being, you know, handed out like uh, free suckers at a park. It's being used appropriately and our vet community is very re respectful of that. It's not being um, abused at all, yes. All right, great. Have your local veterinary clinics updated their euthanasia consent forms to include saliva exposure as a potential rabies exposure? So I can't answer to that, um, but I can tell you that when I met with a lot of the vets in our community, um, a lot of the vets decided to take the opportunity to turn this into a learning event for staff, and they made it into a staff meeting. So I'd have all of their staff in there, and I would do my presentation and then drop them with the come on board for our low cost clinics. Um, so it, at that point we did cover a lot of things like that that brought it to their attention and, and gained a new uh, respect for both of our professions as well. Okay, for municipalities that don't have people that handle wild animal calls, would you suggest residents get in contact with in regards to possible distemper rabies cases? That is a, a tricky question. We're very lucky in Hamilton, um, which is why I guess that it works good that we got the outbreak because we have animal services. Um, if you, I mean, all health units do have the option if there's no human and no domestic attached to a potential rabid animal. We do now have through um, the CWHC, I think it is, um, to submit animals for testing for surveillance purposes. Um, but if it's a uh, wildlife, I would reach out to the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry first and then go from their direction on what to do. But if it's uh, a cat that you, it appears rabid and there is no domestic or human exposure, we do have that new surveillance program that we can use now. Do you have any idea of how effective the oral vaccine baits are? No, I, I can't answer to that. That would be something that uh, Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry would have to answer. Uh, so we have a comment here. The approach for vets seems to be reasonable. Physicians and other healthcare practitioners would generally not conduct a full physical exam for a routine vaccination of humans. So, I, okay, sorry, that was a comment there. Okay. Um, you mentioned that dead animals are picked up from the homeowner's location. Can you elaborate on who's picking up these animals? MNR, municipal staff, health unit. Can you identify the difference in roles between health unit and animal control? for those health units uh, where they are separated from their municipalities? So it is our animal services that does go out and pick up the actual specimen from uh, the community. Um, they've always done that for us. It just obviously elevated during the outbreak. Um, our, their role is to pick it up, euthanize, store, and submit it to um, the Ministry of Natural Resources. Our role comes into play if there's been a domestic attached to that animal, we report it to OMAFRA. If there happened to have been a human exposure attached to that animal, that does not go through the ministry now, it comes through our health unit. Um, and then obviously we're, we're keeping track of the surveillance program. Uh, we get all the positive results coming to us and then we do follow up. Um, trying to read the rest of your question here, make sure I answered everything for you. So the difference in the roles in the health unit and animal control is really animal control is our 
initial stage in the surveillance program, and then we continue on after we get the, the results from that animal. All right, uh, potentially last question here. Do you think that the increase in rabies uh, positive cases are also associated with increased population of raccoons in the region compared to others? Um, I don't have numbers on increased uh, wildlife populations. I do know I, I personally was surprised at the number of raccoons and skunks that are living in our very populated uh, urban areas of our city. Uh, these are animals that we don't normally see because they're out at night and we're not. So they are definitely out there. So I don't know if our area had a larger number than others um, or if it had any reason to do with the outbreak. Uh -huh. In your presentation, you mentioned preliminary testing and further testing. Is the preliminary testing done in Hamilton? And, and then when further testing required, the animal is sent to Lethbridge. What does your preliminary testing include? So the preliminary testing is um, done in Peterborough at the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry in their lab. Um, I could, could try to remember all the steps that they do, but <laughs> I'm not going to try. But essentially, this is a, a test that they um, have developed and are getting licensed, or it has been licensed actually now, um, that just as a preliminary rabies test, still using a brain sample, um, and then their results have been like pretty spot on. Like when they have a positive, it's a FAT positive. When they have a negative, it's an FAT negative. And they continually send controls just to make sure that they're still maintaining that high level. Oh, I'm sorry, the FAT testing is done in Ottawa. Okay. Any other questions in the room? Or online? Okay, nice way to end off with that comment. Yeah. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Um, I would like to thank everyone on the webinar who joined us today for the SciFi Ontario seminar series. Uh, great to have such great participation online. Um, again, if you liked what you heard, sign up for SciFi Ontario's YouTube channel for more information. And I'd like to thank Jane Morell for presenting today. Um, for our participants, please ensure to complete the evaluation from this session. Okay. I'm just seeing some more typing here. Okay. Just general comments. Okay. Uh, stay tuned for our next Sci-Fi Seminar Series on Wednesday, May 9th, where Fatih and Anne Maria will be presenting Geared Towards Compliance, a regulatory training program for public pools and spa operators. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.